Hey everyone, this is Rohan Shaw with BestEconTutor.com, and in this video, we'll be talking about the monopoly equilibrium, monopoly regulation, and price discrimination. Monopolies. What if we ask someone in the real world, hey, what do you think would happen to the price of a good if it was sold by a monopoly, where there's just one business selling it, rather than a competitive market where, you know, that firm has competition? They'll probably say that, oh, the monopoly, I guess, would have a higher price because they have no competition. Let's see what economic theory says. Well, before we talk about monopolies, we have to talk about this new curve that we'll be working with a lot called the marginal revenue curve, MR. Now, you might remember from perfect competition that marginal revenue for a firm in perfect competition is always equal to price. Let's think about what that means. Marginal is the next one. Revenue, that's how much money you're bringing in. So if you're in perfect competition, if the price is $11, that means you're a price taker. Every item you sell is always for $11. So your marginal revenue, the extra revenue from selling one more item is always $11. But here's the thing, a firm in a monopoly has market power. Here's the thing about market power. It's a double-edged sword. Sure, you're not a price taker anymore. You can basically set whatever price you want if you're a monopoly. But anytime you want to sell an extra item, you have to lower your price. See, in perfect competition, you can sell another item for $11, and so your marginal revenue would be $11 equals the price. But if you're in a monopoly, let's say you're selling nine items for $11. Here, if you actually want to sell a tenth item, you have to lower your price. So let's say in this case, if you had to lower your price to $10 to be able to sell that 10th item, let's see, how much revenues were you, were you making originally? Your total revenues originally, uh, $11 each for nine items was $99. And now, you're selling another item, a 10th item, but now you have to lower your price. Here's the key. You have to lower your price for all the items, including all the previous ones that you used to sell for 11. So here, your total revenues are only $100, or $100 10 times 10. So it's 100. So if we think about our marginal revenue, how much extra revenues do we have now that we're selling an extra item? It's only a dollar. Our revenues went from 99 to 100. So even though we sold an extra uh, an item at a price of $10, our marginal revenue wasn't 10, it was only one. So our MR here was only one. It was less than the price. And that's one theme that we're gonna find here is that the MR for a monopoly is always less than the price. Now let's look at what marginal revenue looks like graphically. It always has the exact same y-intercept as demand, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And it has exactly twice the slope, it's twice as steep. The reasoning from that comes from calculus, but we could just take that for granted for now. It always has twice the slope, same intercept, so here's what it looks like. Something like that. Couple things, one is because of that, it always has exactly half of the x-intercept that the demand curve does. So if the demand curve has an x-intercept of 80, then the quantity here will be 40 at this intercept. Further, at this intercept over here where MR is zero, right? The y value of MR is zero when the quantity is 40. This is when you're maximizing revenue. So that's how you maximize revenue, but how do you maximize profit? Well, the golden rule here is MR equals MC. Again, that comes from calculus, so you just have to take that, you know, take that as given for now. But if MR equals MC, you are maximizing your profit. So here, your MR, this black line intersecting with the MC, this upward sloping red one, that's over here. So that's how you know the quantity that you want to produce. So let's say this quantity is 35 or something. So given this graph, a perfectly competitive firm will produce over here. But if you're in a monopoly, two steps. Step one, find the MR curve. Basically, it's half the x-intercept, same y-intercept, so twice the slope. But then see where that MR intersects with the MC, and that's the quantity you're going to want to produce. But here's the thing. For the price, and it's a really common mistake to use that y value as the price, here's what you want to do. You want to go up to the demand curve at that quantity. So at that quantity where MR intersects MC, that's equilibrium quantity, but that's not the equilibrium price. You want to go up to the demand curve. Because, I mean, hey, if you're selling a scarcer quantity, 
of the good compared to perfect competition, you know, people are willing to pay more for that. So you're going to able to you're going to be able to charge more. So either way, that's your price for a monopoly, which is always higher uh, than the price for perfect competition. So remember at the beginning we thought about what the person off the streets would say? Well, I guess their instinct was right. A monopoly will always charge a higher price than a firm in perfect competition. But now we can even specifically say what the producer and consumer surplus would be. The consumer surplus would be anything above that price, so that's just this area underneath the demand. That's the CS. And the producer surplus is everything below that and above the MC curve, so that's all this, this region over here, is the PS. So we have the CS and the PS. Notice though that compared to the perfect competition market, that's, the, that's called the socially efficient point because it has no dead weight loss. What we observe here is if you're in a monopoly, your CS and PS add up to less than what it would have added up to all this if you were in perfect competition. So this region over here, this triangle is called dead weight loss and that's how inefficient we are because we are a monopoly instead of perfect competition. So we just saw that monopolies have a deadweight loss in the market, so what can we do about it? Well, if you're the government of a country, can you try to lower the deadweight loss, maybe even get rid of it? Well, there's one way you can get rid of the deadweight loss, and that's called MC pricing. What it is, is it's a price ceiling. Basically, force the monopoly to set the same price that perfect competition would, and then they'll go up to that quantity, and there won't be any deadweight loss anymore. Let's see how it would work. Let's say this is the graph of a regular monopoly. So we know that where they're, they're gonna produce where the MR, so you actually have to go out of your way to create the MR curve, see where the MR intersects MC. So when there's a lot of graphs, you just gotta you know carefully look at which one's which. So MR equals MC at this quantity. And there the price that they're gonna charge uh, is up to the demand curve. So that's the price that the monopoly is gonna charge. Here's the thing, right off the bat, let's first ask ourselves this. Is this monopoly profitable over here? Is it making a profit? Keep in mind, profit, the equation is, profit is quantity times P minus ATC. The P minus ATC is essentially your per unit profit. You're charging your customers a price of P and it's uh, ATC is the cost on average. And that's your per unit profit times the quantity, gives you your overall profit. So now what we have is your price is this much, but on average, that's where we look at the blue curve. At that quantity that you're selling, this is the average cost of production. So this gap is your per unit profit times the quantity. This is your overall profits if you are a monopoly. So here's the thing. If you wanted to regulate them, let's say you force them to set this low price instead of this price over here. They have to lower it. Here's the thing. The only reason they made this scarce quantity was to be able to charge this high price. So if you're forcing them to charge this low price, they're thinking, I might as well make one more item, because if I make one more, my marginal co uh, cost, notice that the red curve has a lower Y value than this price. So that means it costs them less than this value to make the item. So they might as well make it and earn that, all that extra profit. So that's why, uh, you know, the only benefit of having that low quantity was to have that high price. So if they're going to be forced to have a low price anyways, they're going to want to make the same quantity that perfect competition would and, and make this much you know, producer surplus. But here's the question, what is the profits over here? If you were to regulate it, we know that the deadweight loss now over to here, when you regulate them with MC pricing, will go to zero. Zero deadweight loss because you're at the same quantity that perfect competition is. The profits, P minus ATC, let's see, this is the price and at that quantity, the blue curve still has a lower Y value than the price. So the average cost is still less than the price. So you're still making a positive profit. You know, it's, it's a lower profit than it was when you were maximizing it, but it's still there. So no problem there. Now let's talk about what's called a natural monopoly. It's basically a firm with a lot of fixed costs. And what happens as we'll see is that MC pricing actually doesn't work with that. So imagine you're the only airport in town and you know, you're a monopoly. Most of your costs are fixed costs. You know, the cost of setting up shop, of getting the plane, of hiring a pilot, making sure everything's functioning correctly. So what's your marginal cost? Well, it's not that much, right? It's peanuts. Literally, a bag of peanuts is your cost of having one more passenger on a flight. So here's a problem with MC pricing. If you were forced to charge P equals MC, which is what perfect competition does, you would literally have to charge everyone like 
a dollar per flight if that's what your marginal cost is, but then you're gonna make a loss. So let's look at a graph. Let's see what happens in that case. Let's say this is the graph for a natural monopoly. If there's no regulations, what they'll do is they'll make the MR curve. They'll find where MR equals MC. Let's say the MC is one. It costs you a dollar to make you know, one more unit. Well, the price we're gonna charge is up here. So let's say that's $300 a flight. And let's say your average cost is $200 a flight. So you're making a profit, no problem. But let's say somebody had did MC pricing, so now you're over here. You're forced to make this quantity at a price of one, and now your average cost per person's way higher than a dollar, so you're making a loss. So that's why MC pricing on a natural monopoly will actually make them make a loss. And sure, there'll be zero deadweight loss here temporarily, but then they're gonna shut down in the long run when there's, you know, uh, because they're making a loss. And so that's why there's a compromise. Because here's the thing, you're kind of split. Do, if you're the government, you're thinking on the one hand, do I do nothing, leave it unregulated? And in that case, we know that there's, you know, they're gonna make a profit, but notice there's all this deadweight loss in that case. So that's one option. On the other hand, you could do MC pricing, have no deadweight loss, but then they're probably gonna eventually shut down because they're making a loss. So the compromise is what's called ATC pricing. And that's where you force them to produce, not where MC and demand intersect, but where ATC and demand intersect. So you're forcing them to produce this quantity at this price. So here's the benefit of it. The deadweight loss, instead of being all this if you were to do nothing, the deadweight loss is only this much because that's how far off you are from perfect competition. Not only that, but the firm won't want to shut down because they're not making a loss. They're not making a profit either though, because here, the price that they're charging, that's the same Y value as you know the blue, the blue curve over there, which is their average cost. So on average, if that's 150, it's like they're charging 150 a flight and it costs them on average 150 a flight. So they're making a profit of zero. And that always happens with ATC pricing and there'll be some data rate loss, but it's better than doing nothing. Finally, let's talk about price discrimination. You only have this option if you're a monopoly. Now, there's first degree price discrimination, AKA perfect price discrimination, and here's what that is. It's when you're charging every individual a different price, namely the most that they're willing to pay. There's not really any real world examples of this, so here's a fictional one. Imagine you're a mind reading pizza store owner that's selling pizza by the slice, so let's say the first customer walks in, you do some mind reading and you're like, hmm, okay, it's $9 a slice. The customer is saying, oh wow, $9. If you would have said 901, I would have walked out, but you know, sure, I guess. So they pay you the $9. Now the second guy comes in, you mind read, and you say, it's $7 a slice. And they're like, wow, you would have said 701, I would have walked out. And so they pay seven. So basically, every customer is paying the most that they're willing to. So that's the value on the demand curve, the Y value, the willingness to pay is what they're paying you. So instead of charging the same low price for everything, you're actually charging a different price. And so now you actually get all this as a part of your producer surplus. And the thing is you don't need to stop now where MR equals MC, you can go all the way over here where supply and demand usually intersect for perfect competition because you, know, you don't sort of lose profits on earlier products as we talked about earlier. Uh, so it's kind of like your marginal revenue isn't really, you know, affected by that. So you might as well just get whatever you can, sell as many slices as you can, and that's why you're actually going to produce the same quantity, which ironically makes this efficient because there's no deadweight loss. It's the same amount of total consumer and producer surplus as it is under perfect competition. But all of this is producer surplus. There's actually zero consumer surplus. Now the other type of discrimination that you learn about is third degree price discrimination, AKA multi-market discrimination. Now this is where it's not quite as fine grained as first degree where you're discriminating by the individual. Here you're discriminating by the group, the type of group of uh, people. So let's say you own a movie theater and you're charging let's say $7 a ticket, you know, as a monopolist. But then let's say you realize that, hmm, you know what? I can kind of identify whether someone's a student or not, based on whether they have a student ID. And let's say you're kind of thinking, hmm, you know, students seem to be quite 
elastic. They have a lot of alternatives, and I feel like I'm losing a lot of students by charging $7 a ticket. And if I charge something lower, I'd get so many more students through the door. On the other hand, part of you is also thinking, but, you know, all these non-students, all these adults that are just sort of coming in, it's like, I could charge them more than seven and they'd still come, you know? So part of you wants to lower the price for the students and raise the price for, the, uh, for everyone else, but, you know, you can't if you're not allowed to discriminate. So let's say you actually are allowed to do third degree price discrimination, meaning by the group. Well, here's how you do it. You basically split the market into the two different types of consumers, the two different groups. And once you've done, split that, which usually they won't ask you to split that, they'll give you the two different graphs on any problem. All you have to do from there is MR equals MC and find the price like you normally would. So you kind of solve for the equilibrium separately for the two different groups. One doesn't even affect the other and that's how you find the equilibrium optimal price for each market. So for students, let's say you do the MR, find the MR, see where MR equals MC and go up to the demand for the price and let's say you found that was five. This means that you're making a lot more producer surplus by charging students $5 a ticket instead of seven. So by charging them five, you're gonna maximize profit. And let's say for non-students, you do the same thing. You find your MR, see where MR equals MC, go up to the demand curve, and let's say that was 10. This means that you're now gonna be able to charge them $10 a ticket, and you're making a lot more than if you were to only charge them seven, because that's how you maximize profit there, and that's how you maximize profit there. There's still some deadweight loss, unlike first degree, but you know that's how you can do third degree price discrimination. Now let's look at a question from a student. Why is the slope of MR always twice the slope of demand? Why not 1.9 or 2.1? Good question. Here's the thing. This requires a little bit of calculus, but just the simplest kind. And it's actually pretty easy to see. The derivative, meaning the slope of anything, is marginal, the, the marginal value of it. So long story short, if we find the total revenue, the equation for total revenue, its derivative would be the marginal revenue. So total revenue is just price times quantity, price times quantity. And here's the thing. If you're thinking about the demand curve, the Y value is price, and this is just an MX plus B, right? So let's do that. Price really is an MX plus B, so M, but the X value, we're calling it Q, so it's really MQ plus B, so that's the equation for your demand. So we can actually plug that in and say total revenue is really, and we can replace price with MX plus B, right? So that's what your demand curve is, but either way, now we have that times Q. That's your total revenue. And we can even distribute that out. We can distribute out the Q, so that's MQ squared, Q times Q, plus BQ. So that's your total revenue equation. So your marginal revenue is simply the derivative. Now if you were to take the derivative of this, just the two comes down, so that's two MQ. So that's Q is kind of like X. And then BQ, the derivative of that's just B, just like the derivative of five X is five, the derivative of BQ, B is a constant, so that's just B. Either way, here's the equation that we got. If we were the first economist in the world, we'd say MR is always this. Now if you think about it, our demand was this, right? So let's think about it. They have the same intercept, B. They have the same B. But slope, this guy's slope was M, and this guy's slope, 2M. So that's how we know that the marginal revenue is always twice as steep as the demand, not 2.1 times as steep, not 1.9 times as steep. And our final question. Isn't perfect price discrimination inefficient because there's no consumer surplus? Good question. If we defined efficiency as having a high consumer surplus and a high producer surplus, then absolutely, there's no consumer surplus, so that would be inefficient. But the way we define efficient is the highest possible total CS and PS. So we, we don't really care in that case about the breakdown of how much was CS, how much was PS, when we're talking about efficient the way economists define it. And so that's why, even though there's no CS, because the total CS and PS add up to just as much as it ever could be if it was perfect competition, that's why perfect price discrimination is actually efficient. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. 
and we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.